you're listening to RWA Radio. RWA News Round. <laughs> Thank you for consuming your weekly dose of disinformation. Today is Orthodox Easter or Pascha, the most important and wholesome holiday of the year. Христос Воскресе. Воистину Воскресе. For the first time, I have been following strict fasting. I suggest all our American Orthobro LARPers to do the same. I didn't eat meat or milk products. And uh, you know what? It's not nearly as hard as I made it out to be. I have lost about one kilo. Probably learned a dozen of new recipes, which is pretty useful. For Kirill, it's called steak time. <laughs> <laughs> When Bob called uh, Kirill an insane monk, he was right. Because Kirill is actually a monk of the Frankish persuasion. <laughs> he believes in redemption through sin and debauchery. What can you say in your defense, Kirill? <laughs> no, actually, I have been uh, fasting for the last couple of years too, um, before Risto. Um, I didn't observe the complete strict fast, um, but I cleared that with my priest. Uh, he said that I actually shouldn't uh, fast as strict because, um, well, because of work and stuff. Um, I, I think it's uh, the most um, important difference between, for example, like uh, Lent and, I don't know, like Ramadan or something, uh, because it's not just a set of rules that you're supposed to follow. It's very individual and it's about your individual uh, yeah. spiritual journey and you should always um, discuss uh, your fast with your priest, how strict it's supposed to be. Because I've talked to uh, my priest, he said that many people, especially who come newly to the faith um, or like who have been lapsed Christians for their whole lives and then uh, choose to return someday, they just uh, jump in and try to observe the very, very strict fast, and they fail, and they get bitter about it, and uh, it might even damage their spiritual journey. So it's it's not recommended that if you've never fasted before to immediately try to observe all the rules. Like, I went without meat, and mostly without dairy, um, but not completely, so, yeah. I think it helps also with... Um the sense of time, mm -hmm. you know, because uh, April is nothing without uh, fasting. It's just another month. Uh, you can discuss whether it's pointless. Mm -hmm. But uh, here you can sense uh, the common, you know, uh, advancement to some great holiday, the communal spirit, yes. as it were. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. And also there's um, a tradition where if you don't observe the very strict fast, you just... Uh, strict you fast more strict in the last week of the fast um, i for example i chose to forego cigarettes for the last uh, week of uh, fast and that was really hard it was a lot harder than uh, not eating meat yeah have you achieved it uh, the uh, seven day smoking uh, fast mostly mostly yeah i had like uh, three four five cigarettes left or so i bumped one of a colleague at work uh, so not completely <laughs> but i haven't smoked this little in like seven years so uh, i still say uh, it's vapes a uh, i did i did vape uh, in the mornings and before sleeping <laughs> Yeah, because uh, that would be highly improbable <laughs> if you didn't vape as well. Because, yeah... No, I, 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 I think I would have just died of nicotine withdrawal. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's heavy, man. But, yeah, I haven't even dreamed of um, nicotine fasting, but I probably should as well. Okay, let's talk about customs of Pascha. Because today is a great holiday and Russians uh, all over the world, and not only Russians, of course, but I, I'm not sure. Is the egg coloring and the Kulich tradition alive uh, outside of uh, the Russian world? Or is it just a local thing? Uh, well, well, Easter eggs, yeah, I think Easter eggs, I think everyone uh, in the West also. Oh, yeah, sure. They, That makes sense. They color yeah. eggs because it's just, uh, I think it just smoothly transitioned into the secular Easter with the bunnies and so on. I'm actually not sure where the eggs come from um, for Easter. So. Yeah, yeah. But I don't know, it's a cute tradition. Very Probably so. Kulich is a Russian tradition. Yes, though. yes, the Kulich is Russian. Uh, some other cultures also have... Uh, Easter cakes, I know, um, I think the Italians have one, I don't remember what it's mm. called, but it's uh, 
Panettone, I think, but I'm not sure if it's for Easter. I think it's a Christmas cake in Italy, but it's very similar to our Kulich. And it's actually a pizza with anchovies. <laughs> yeah. Kulich is an interesting topic because uh, when I was a kid, everyone celebrates Easter or Pascha in Russia. Even people who are, aren't that religious at all. It's just a big holiday like 9 of May, Victory Day or New Year. So everyone is eating kulichi right now. When I walked into the bakery this morning, woman behind the counter just uh, loudly exclaimed Christos Vaskresia, which is uh, pretty charming and brave, because what if I was a Muslim or something, or a Jew, or... Uh, it's pretty... Or uh, even waste, worse, racist. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. But it is pretty waste. But Kulichi, when I was a kid, were untasty. The kulichi of the store variety that you bought at retail stores were terrible and uh, my family didn't bake that much so mm -hmm. I had to suffer through the famously unsavory biscuits with uh, sweet toppings. Uh, you know, all kids love mm -hmm. the sweet toppings and they just uh, throw away the rest. But now it's all different because now bakeries and even stores uh, learn how to bake kulichi with uh, tvorok. Mm -hmm. So it's uh, really, really tasty. Yeah, in general, uh, things have improved a lot on that front. Uh, like every uh, restaurant chain or something, they have fasting options and uh, yeah, it's, yeah. it's really cool. Fasting menus, fasting stickers uh, in supermarkets, it wasn't there even mm -hmm. like five years ago. Yeah, that's so true. Orthodox faith has been integrated in the capitalist machine. So <laughs> I am not sure how to feel about it, but it is pretty useful. Okay, as uh, my wife right now coloring the eggs and uh, putting little stickers on them, uh, let's <laughs> jump in to the newsreel. News to the news round. Nonsense words uh, that makes us look <laughs> professional. <laughs> All right. News of the week. Uh, Armenians versus... Asi oh, yeah, no. Kyrgyz uh, versus Tajiks. <laughs> I mix it up. <laughs> you can ask uh, who was in the round here. But what you should actually question is what is the common theme here? The similar trope here is Turkish meddling and certain organization, ODKB, Collective Security Treaty Organization. It's an intergovernmental military alliance of Eurasian CIS countries, which is a, a huge mess, actually. Let's look at it closely. The logo of Collective Security Treaty Organization looks exactly like NATO, but with a Eurasian twist. <laughs> Armenia, Belarus, Russia, Kazakhstan, Tajikistan, and Kyrgyzia. Well, three members of this uh, seven-country alliance are either involved in open conflict right now, or there are some sporadic hostilities that neither Russia nor ODKB even cares. Not all CIS states are even inside this organization. For example, Uzbekistan and uh, Azerbaijan left the treaty. Yeah, uh, and, and, and I think uh, Serbia is like an observer state. Yeah, and uh, there is actually a rival organization called GUAM, or Organization for Democracy and Economic Development with headquarters in Ukraine, which is pretty ironic, Economic Development and Ukraine, <laughs> uh, which, uh, which is a Turkish front. Georgia, Azerbaijan and Moldavia are inside the Guam organization. It's a complete enemy of uh, ODKB. So it's a mess. Even for Eurasian CIS standards, it's uh, just laughable. And it begs one question. What is the purpose of the, this military treaty when its members don't care about it? No rules are being enforced. Let's take a look at what actually happened. On the last days of April, um, there was a little skirmish on the border between Kyrgyzstan and Tajikistan. 200 people suffered injuries and 20 have died. The border between Tajikistan and Kyrgyzstan is around uh, 1,000 kilometers 
And after the dissolution of the Soviet Union, there are many regions where there is no clear demarcation or delimitation. So there are constantly little conflicts because uh, there are just uh, strips of land where it's not completely sure to whom they belong and so on. On April 28th, on one of the border posts uh, between Kyrgyzstan and Tajikistan, somewhere near Sogdia, um, there was a conflict because the Tajiks, they started putting cameras on a border pole. Kyrgyz side claims that it was on the Kyrgyz side where they placed the cameras and they started uh, sawing down the pole where the cameras were installed. And there was a conflict between the crews, like the crew who installed the cameras and the one who started sawing down the pole. Uh, it actually just became a fist fight, more or less. Then they started throwing rocks at each other. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> a slow evolution of combat. <laughs> yes, yes. It, it's very interesting. I think there was. Uh, it's. I think it's a consequence just of general military de-escalation. Like you had this uh, between, I think India and, and and China, or where was it? Where they were also killing each other with sticks and stones because they weren't allowed to shoot. So according to the Kyrgyz side, uh, the next day, April 29th, the situation escalated because uh, the Tajiks started throwing rocks at both uh, Kyrgyz soldiers and uh, like windows on the Kyrgyz side. And then uh, someone started shooting with hunting rifles. It's not clear whether it was military personnel or not, or just civilians. Uh, it's uh, all very muddy. Then in the evening, the Tajiks started also uh, shooting at border posts. Well, then they started using heavier weapons. Uh, they started using mortars against each other. Then Kyrgyz uh, special ops team raided a Tajik border post. Khodja Aro is what it was called. And uh, that's when they started uh, slowly mobilizing and uh, pulling troops to the border. They started just shooting at each other. And uh, yeah, it escalated slowly. They And I think uh, by evening of April 29th, they were like using helicopters and shooting at each other and uh, aviation and stuff so it almost uh, broke out into like a war and i think then they realized that it's actually extremely retarded what they are doing and they agreed to pull back their forces to where they were before the conflict it has actually many reasons one is uh, as big dog already explained the unclear status of the treaties of the alliance treaties and uh, they don't mean re anything really there is also the point that the border is extremely stupid because it was never supposed to be a national border. It's just the internal Soviet border. And when the Soviet Union wa uh, was uh, dissolved, um, the borders of the Soviet republics just stayed the same, uh, despite uh, the borders are not made to uh, like, it a looks exist like it as was, sovereign states. Yeah. It looks like it was drawn by a mentally retarded toddler. And the same toddler had decided to leave these people <laughs> to their own devices and uh, to not have any control over their militaries and give them sovereignty. Yes, uh, people who are into grand strategy games by Paradox call this border goal. Yeah. Uh, there is also uh, the problem that uh, one of the main routes of heroin trafficking from Afghanistan it uh, goes exactly through this region. And, um, well, of course, officially both sides are supposed to stop the drug trafficking, but unofficially uh, on both sides there are corrupt elements who just profit from this and uh, they work together with the drug traffickers uh, because the drugs, they go uh, from Afghanistan to Russia and then to the rest of Europe. So, yeah, it's all very difficult. And it's mainly a consequence of the uh, hasty dissolution of the Soviet Union, I'd say. It's just because the borders suck. Um, they are not supposed to exist as sovereign states in this form. And uh, there have to be some adjustments, but nobody wants to make these adjustments. And Russia, which would be, the, of course, the natural mediator for any conflicts in the region, doesn't really involve itself in this stuff especially because in all the Central Asian countries or most of the Central Asian countries, except maybe Kazakhstan, I think, uh, there, are, there is very strong meddling from outside states. There is uh, yeah. a very strong Chinese influence, a very strong American influence, um, a very strong Turkish influence. So they all uh, make 
basically Russian mediation more or less impossible in this region. There is there is a strong rumor that it was the Turks who sold uh, military drones to Kyrgyzia and uh, ODKB member to fight against uh, Tajikistan, also an ODKB member. Im just imagine Russia selling Bulgaria fighter jets to attack uh, Albania to NATO states uh, or something like that. It's all completely unserious. Uh, last few years have been nothing but a successful Turkish uh, march through uh, Armenia, Azerbaijan to the soft underbelly of uh, Russia. Putin, very small post-Soviet countries against each other, uh, selling weaponry, instigating conflicts, uh, real or imagined. What should have been under a complete Russian sphere of influence, in practice, is nothing but a Turkish playground. So, uh, let's uh, talk about the um, stats. Uh, Three-day conflict ended up with 33 Tajik soldiers killed and 155 wounded. Kyrgyzia lost uh, 10 soldiers and 90 injured. Result is a ceasefire with an uh, uncertain future. Is this it? Do you think that there will be some more major conflict? Well, I think in the very near future it's uh, probably uh, less likely because now after this conflict uh, Russia should be paying more attention to the region and maybe uh, engage more diplomatically. But on the other hand, I think that in the long run it's inevitable that there will be large-scale conflicts in Central Asia simply because of... Um, well, you, you know how... Um, People uh, always say that the, all the wars in Africa and the India-Pakistan situation and Palestine-Israel, uh, it all happened because it was just Europeans who came there, conquered the lands and made absolutely random borders that were guided exclusively by economic interest and just what looks pretty on the map. So straight lines and so on. And the borders in Central Asia, they are very much close to this. They are also just more or less pulled out of Lenin's ass or Stalin's but ass. they don't look pretty on the map. They don't look pretty. Uh, they had uh, other guidances for like uh, they dissolved more or less the Russian colonial project in uh, southern Siberia or the southern Urals. I mean there were no Kazakhs before the revolution. Kazakh nation was uh, known as a uh, a variety of Kyrgyz. So basically most people who live there are just uh, a variety of steppe Kyrgyz who were just rapidly forced to uh, leave behind their nomadic pastoralist lifestyle and settle down and uh, were forced into kolkhoze to produce cotton for the Soviet industry. And it's all um, very unnatural what happened there. You know, uh, they, the borders, are, they don't correspond really to any ethnic or political borders. Uh, I mean, okay, uh, there are no religious problems because they're all Muslim, but there are very much ethnic tensions and all like tribal tensions, I guess. Also, all the Central Asian countries, they started rapidly becoming very nationalist after 91 when the Soviet Union was dissolved to create a kind of their own identity for the first time in history. So, of course, there are kind of overcompensating and uh, you have kind of these peoples who yesterday they were still like uh, living in yurts uh, in the steppe and uh, today they are like uh, using drones bought from Turkey to defend their sacred borders, uh, sacred which, have, which have existed for like uh, less than 30 years. It's going to explode sooner or later if Russia doesn't step in, I think. And also you have, of course, the drug problem, because many interested parties don't want the heroin trafficking to stop, uh, I think. Actually, interesting that, uh, wasn't it a couple months ago that America has finally left uh, Afghanistan? Uh, yeah, they are in the process uh, of leaving more or less, and uh, maybe when the Taliban take over there will be a crackdown on uh, drug trafficking because the USMC isn't there anymore to protect the poppy fields. <laughs> yeah, 
that's weird that they are living like that but it's probably fake uh, in any case enough for the, this topic let's uh, discuss uh, russian diplomats uh, being sent out of various eastern european countries over the czech military stash explosions in, that happened in 2014 so Russian diplomats are being sent out right now for something that happened seven years ago and I thought that Estonians were slow. <laughs> but uh, let's uh, talk about that because it's uh, insanely entertaining. You might have heard about the Salisbury poisoning and the usual suspects. Uh, it's uh, just a sitcom with uh, two Russian spies, Alexander Petrov and Ruslan Bashirov or Mishkin or Chipiga. They have various names. It's all very James Bond-esque uh, what is happening because it's always the same scenario. What happened in Czech Republic in 2014? The Czech had some arms depot that was exporting weaponry, uh, not only in Ukraine, but uh, because of uh, the Donbas war, start of the Donbas war, uh, naturally most of the weaponry was dedicated to Ukraine uh, through some Bulgarian arms dealer Emilian Gebrev. So these uh, weapons were waiting for sh the shipment and Petrov and Bashirov <laughs> <laughs> under f fake passports just came to the Czech Republic and exploded the whole arms depot. Yeah, there were like 50 tons of uh, armaments and explosives yeah. and stuff like that, and it was just blown up. And uh, I, I think like two, two people died and a couple of villages had to be evacuated and yeah. Almost a year they were dealing with the consequences of this uh, explosion. Yes, and uh, a couple of months later, the Bulgarian arms dealer who was uh, organizing this whole deal, uh, he was... Um, Poisoned, and no shock. Yes, yes, <laughs> and of course our favorite um, independent journalists um, from Bellingcat, they of course concluded that he was also poisoned by Novichok and probably also by Petrov and Pashirev, who are who are kind of like. Um, yeah, uh, they are really like sitcom characters, you know. They are the <laughs> yeah, yeah. Bud Spencer and Terence Hill of, uh, of, of Russian spec ops. <laughs> <laughs> and they are the only agents that Russian secret services even have. They are so secret that uh, the whole world uh, knows about them. But they are, aren't stopping. Yeah, so they yes. Just, so uh, currently, uh, the, or before this happened, the Czech Republic was in negotiations with Russia about buying several million doses of the Sputnik V vaccine the Russian Corona vaccine, which is supposedly very effective and is being bought up by many countries around the world because of shortages and uh, logistic problems and um, some medical problems with the other vaccines. And uh, these negotiations were cut short by the Czech Republic suddenly declaring that Russia blew up the weapons stash in 2014 and then they um, yeah, banned 20 or 18 uh, Russian diplomats from the country. Am I right that nothing before Bellingcat and Insider uh, were <clears throat> writing this stuff in September 2020? No one really cared and no one connected yeah. <laughs> uh, what was happening to Russia or Russian intelligence services. I mean, it's possible, um, of course. It, it might be like, I don't know, uh, an accident or a false flag or whatever, but I think it's completely possible that uh, the Russian Secret Service actually blew this uh, stash up. Maybe not even because, you know, because uh, these weapons would have been so extremely important for the conflicts in Ukraine and Syria, but just so the Czech Republic does, doesn't get any stupid ideas anymore. Yeah, to send a signal. Whatever happened, it's now used to plummet the ratings of Russia in Eastern Europe because they were awfully high. Too high for the Western Europe or the British and Anglo-American uh, world to deal with because every Gallup poll showed that uh, like in Slovakia and uh, countries like that, people actually 
either didn't care much about Russia or were mostly positive about it. It was not good for European Union and NATO. Of yeah, course. and I think right now it's also, um, I think they have two large reasons uh, for doing this. Uh, the first is, of course, ongoing, and also the reason for the whole Navalny stuff is uh, they want to sabotage Nord Stream 2 before it gets completed. And also, right now, uh, many, many countries are just buying the Sputnik V vaccine. Mm, and this is, of course, very good for Russia's uh, international image, just diplomatically. You know, uh, it's not even really political or economic or anything, but it's just uh, it's a sign that uh, dealing with Russia in good faith is... Uh, a thing that you can do and that it's useful and that it's uh, good to have good relations with Russia and so on. And of course, uh, well, the EU and the US, they can't really have this. Let's uh, consider that uh, Petrov and Bashirov actually blew up this military stash. So in 2014 alone, Russia is uh, taking back Crimea with no shots uh, fired. It uh, blows up uh, military stash uh, in the middle of Europe, not being captured, not uh, even being blamed for it. It's so cool, right? And uh, now they're just on the constant defensive. They just can't deal with anything. Petrov and Bashirov are laughing stocks. They were being interviewed by Margarita Simonian and they were called gay couple that was visiting <laughs> Salisbury. Uh, it's r just ridiculous. Like uh, our intelligence services were replaced after 2014 because what they had achieved back then is uh, a completely different level what they are doing now. Ooh, it's a difficult question. I think it's mostly a question of uh, diplomatic and economic pressure because, um, you know, the sanctions... Um, I think that Russia doesn't care much about the sanctions to its economy and uh, I, I know not being able to import specific Italian cheeses or whatever. Um, but what the Russian ruling class really cares about is being hit in their wallets. Um, it's being hit in their Western bank accounts and so on. And of course, um, they might just cave under the pressure. And uh, I'm not sure what's going on. I, I'm, it is maybe prudent to assume incompetence instead of conspiracy, but I'm not convinced that uh, it's not all um, basically just as planned. Yes, I don't believe that uh, Russians are this naturally incompetent. I think uh, what is now happening is not our level at all. So I'm not expecting the best news ahead, but that would make uh, our program be more entertaining for you. you. <laughs> <laughs> Although okay. I have to say, now that you're talking about it, there was uh, some interview with the Colonel Stilkov uh, a while ago, where he did say um, very unflattering things about his former FSB colleagues and that uh, the level of competence that one usually assumes for uh, the secret service of the largest nation on earth is uh, not a given uh, right now because there have been like structural problems and so on and it's not as good as it could be, but I'm not sure. Yeah, you know, we talked about Zhirinovsky build and uh, in a week from now, uh, you will get an entire Zhirinovsky themed episode. But right now I'm feeling uh, Strelkov peeled. And I think that Strelkov also deserves an entire episode dedicated to him. Because it's a hero of uh, Donbass, the most um, competent leader of Donbass rebels that took Slavyansk. What is Strelkov peeled after he departed from Ukraine? It's very, well, it's, <laughs> it's a very bleak outlook on the Russian elite and uh, the government. Yeah, he went uh, just, he became extremely black pilled and he's just giving interviews about how Russia is fucked and uh, how everything is that, bad. Yeah. And, and not because he's some liberal English shield or whatever, he is a true patriot. So yes, uh, that's... Uh, I didn't really get what was his black pills are about, but uh, now I'm getting into it, I think. Let's hope that's not for long. The last item. 
weird item on our list. It's a radical pro-Ukrainian skinhead organization that uh, was fun functioning in Ukraine and Russia in various Russian cities, and they were captured by the yeah, police. Yeah, 16, 16 people were arrested um, last Thursday in connection uh, with this Ukrainian organization, uh, MKU, um, which was kind of, it's very strange. It's like a, yeah. it's, it's, it's like a mix uh, between um, a skinhead gang from the 90s and, you know, some kind of uh, postmodern um, internet death cult. Yeah, yeah, yeah. M MKU, it's an abbreviation for Cult of Maniacs Killing. What, what killings, whatever that means. So it's uh, like a fan group for Burns serial on, killers, yeah. yeah. Uh, that uh, retro thing that you probably forgot about. So it was just uh, some jerk of public on VK. Uh, but it's really weird. So let's start from the beginning. In 2016, some 20-year-old guy... Uh, in Dnipropetrovsk or Dnipro, which is a big city in Ukraine or Dnipro River. He was a regular provincial dumbfuck who uh, wanted some violence in his life, so he started uh, attacking some uh, homeless people, sleeping homeless people with a knife and stuff like that. So he had a small gang of people or whatever. It's a completely trivial thing that happened uh, all over Russia and uh, Russian world in the 90s and uh, 2000s. Crazed teenagers uh, just attacking homeless people or gypsies or migrants because skinhead uh, movement was in Russian world was all about violence and that's what uh, these teenagers wanted to feel alive. But it kind of fizzled out in the last decade or more in Russia proper. I haven't heard about skinheads for for a while now. Because Ukraine is uh, a bit uh, lives in the past uh, and after Maidan and glorification of uh, various uh, Banderist organizations, it was okay to be a skinhead. So he was captured and uh, put to jail. And that uh, story should have ended there. But apparently some guys uh, wanted to continue and uh, make an ideology around community on the internet and uh, apparently the guy in jail just made requests for them from the inside of prison via the internet so he was sitting in the prison and he was uh, writing some texts uh, that demanded members of the school to kill a homeless person or whatever something like that so it was um, low-key widespread in Ukraine, but then it uh, caught uh, some attention in Russia, various uh, Russian cities. The cities under a million of people, like Irkutsk, uh, Krasnodar, Saratov, Tambov, Chita, Anapa, no major cities at all. Some teenagers uh, started organizing around this uh, public and attacking homeless. Was this uh, organization a pro-Ukrainian one? Uh, I think so. I think this uh, whole thing, it ties into like three different things that one has to talk about. First of all, um, radical nationalists being pro-Ukrainian is a problem that Russia has had since 2014. Um, because like fully half of, I think, uh, radical nationalists in Russia just became extremely pro-Ukrainian. Many went to fight even in Battalion Azov and the other CIA-sponsored uh, Nazi units in Donbas and so on. Um, this, has, this has historical reasons because Ukraine was always uh, regarded by radical nationalists as a friendly country. Many uh, nationalists were persecuted in Russia. They found exile in Ukraine. They had ties to Ukrainian nationalist organizations and so on. And this all went on until, well, until this whole thing became a military confrontation. And then the, a large part, a large segment of uh, radical nationalists in Russia kind of became a fifth column for uh, Ukraine in Russia. Um, I have even some personal experience with this. Um, I was in Moscow and I was um, meeting with a friend who was a veteran uh, of the 
Donbass war and um, I actually um, he was on the run at that moment from Ukrainian nationalists in Moscow. So they had, they had doxed him and they were like actively stalking him. And uh, and this was this was like in in Moscow, you had uh, Russians hunting down a Russian veteran um, because uh, he was like I don't know like a Russian imperialist who fought against the innocent Ukrainian Azov battalion. On one hand, it uh, just shows that Russia is a great country because uh, some yeah, be, countries yeah because yeah, it, because it, these people are alive. Like, yes, yes, yes. Like I remember, I remember talking to like uh, friends from other countries, um, and they were all like, like, why are these people allowed to live in Russia? Why are they, are they not being lynched in the streets and so on? And yeah, I think this is. Uh, this just shows how much of a liberal and tolerant country yeah, Russia really it's is. It's ridiculous. Can you imagine even now in modern day in Serbia, Serbian youth uh, actively supporting the Ustashe movement? This is just ridiculous. But uh, Russia is way too civilized, way too liberal, and the Russian identity is not as uh, f uh, formulated and strong as uh, imagined, imagined identities of uh, Russia's periphery. Yeah, so, uh, and uh, what also ties into this, uh, at that time, the Ukrainian secret services were also involved in this. They were, like, uh, actively uh, funneling money and weapons to these pro-Ukrainian nationalists in Russia. And um, I think uh, this is uh, all, I think maybe not directed, by the SBU, but it's probably, you know, the uh, leftovers of the 2014 PSYOP just running wild, just people who are PSYOPed into this uh, cold ideology of how Russia is uh, very evil and Ukraine is this white the Aryan empire. Yeah. They were kids, though. They just... Uh, yeah. they I don't think that we were cognizant in 2014, but now <laughs> they just living in the wild past uh, of yes. Russia. This and, is uh, and such also weird. and also there is a general trend of uh, like we had this uh, some years ago. Uh, there was another uh, violent internet cult in Russia. It was it was made out to be larger than it was by media, of course. It was very hysteric. All the coverage. But it did exist, it did actually the exist. Blue whale. Yes, the blue whale, which was a uh, phenomenon on uh, the Russian social network Vkontakte. Uh, this was basically just, uh, I think it grew out of Chan culture, um, because like the Russian equivalent to 4chan, which is, which is Dvach, it's uh, even more degenerate than 4chan. And uh, they came up with this uh, weird psyop uh, to... Well, basically, it was uh, kind of an aesthetic posting account, uh, and they were trying to psyop people into killing themselves, like with challenges and uh, recording videos and so on. Uh, it's not clear really how large of a phenomenon it was, because the media coverage was uh, incredibly hysteric, and uh, you couldn't really get to the truth of it. But it did exist, it did exist, and I think there were some teenagers who actually killed themselves as a result of this shit. And uh, it is a general trend, I think, maybe of the darker side of the Russian internet that you have uh, many insane people who just uh, actively try to uh, provoke real-life violence. It is a structural problem. Do you remember the album title of Grob Ruskaya Poly Experimenta for Russian Field of Experiments? But right now Russia is a field of psyops that are being just uh, tested out on Russian populace. That's what I feel. They were uh, they are trying to make them kill uh, themselves uh, to join the pro-Ukrainian <laughs> movement in Chita, <laughs> which, which is just re retarded. But it kind of works. And uh, well, I think what uh, I, I haven't really thought about it before we started recording, but uh, right now that we're talking about it. Um, foreign propaganda inspiring Russian youth to engage in absolutely senseless random violence is um, for the political aims of foreign countries is exactly the same that happened in the uh, early 20th century in Russia. So where yeah. you had all these socialist revolutionaries throwing bombs at cafes, it's exactly the same. This is a weird time for Russia in general, but uh, if we are to forget all these happenings and 
uh, fixate our gaze on eternal things. All is going well. Today is Pascha, the Christ has risen, and RWA just fed you another dose of disinformation. So stay tuned, like and share new format if you like it, if you want more news reels, newscasts, news rounds. <laughs> Goodbye.